Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. You know, in the, the first chapter of Ruth, you'll find where Naomi almost changed her name to Mara because she felt that God had dealt bitterly with her. And she was frustrated and she was discouraged and she was just at her wit's end. However, before it was all over, if you read the story, you know that God was with her. Amen. And there's one thing that Naomi discovered as she gathered wood for the winter season. She discovered that God is more than able to meet your need. Come on, give God a praise. And I want to tell you this morning that God is more than able to meet your need. Amen. Even though she was discouraged, she was frustrated, she found out that God was more than enough, that he was faithful. This morning, I want to just take a few moments to talk with you. I don't know if I'm teaching, preaching, or I don't know what I'm doing this morning, but I'm going to talk with you about not allowing frustration and discouragement to win in your life. Come on, give him a praise. David, he says in Psalms 42, verse 5, the New Living Translation, David says, why am I discouraged? David was king of Israel. He had everything going for him. Even though he had enemies on both sides, he knew that God was with him. And he couldn't understand when he wrote this particular psalm why he was discouraged. And the reality is that all of us have moments of discouragement. Discouragement is universal. It hits all of us from time to time. And just because you have moments of discouragement does not mean that you are a carnal Christian. Amen, somebody. People think that if they get discouraged that they're not spiritual. They think that spiritual people don't get discouraged. They think that people who know the Bible don't get discouraged. They think that folks who are uh, mature in the word don't get discouraged. But the truth is anybody who tells you that they have not experienced discouragement from one moment at some time in their life is not telling you the truth. Come on, give God a praise for that. The reality is there are times when life can really frustrate us. Life can really get frustrating from time to time based on what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. But you have to recognize that just because that spirit of frustration and discouragement comes to attack you, that you're not a bad person, that you're not, you know, you haven't lost your salvation, you know, you, you, God still loves you. Amen. You just are having a moment in your walk with God, where life is trying to get the best of you. And the reality is, if you're not careful, whether you are born again or not, life will get the best of you. Amen. Moses got discouraged. He got so discouraged that him and God was arguing about who people the Israel belonged to. Moses said, they're your people. God said, no, no, uh, no, they're yours. So they're going back and forth. Job got discouraged because of what he was going through in his life, because of the trial that he was experiencing in his life. How many know that trials can, at times, discourage you? Yeah. Amen, somebody. He said, Pastor Doug, while you're teaching on this, I'm teaching on this because I've been praying, and every time I, I, I pray, I can't get past what I want to pray for because I see faces coming up. And the Lord's showing me faces and showing me saints who are in need of intercession. Because life is trying to get the best of them. And I'm telling you this morning as a born again believer, do not allow life to get the best of you. Come on, give God a praise. 
Now you got to be careful because the problem with discouragement is that discouragement, if you listen to it, it will cause you to make bad decisions. It will cause you to make bad choices. And discouragement will keep you from being effective for God. Because when you get discouraged, you don't want to read your Bible. You don't want to pray. You want to quit. You want to give up. You don't want to go to the church. You don't want to talk to the saints. Because in your mind, they're going to judge me. And you don't want to be bothered with anybody. You have a tendency to want to isolate. And this is what the enemy wants. Because the enemy knows that if he can isolate you, he can work on you by yourself. And how many know that we're not designed to do this walk by ourselves? We are the body of Christ. Amen. Amen, somebody. And one of the major problems with discouragement is that when you get discouraged, you lose your perspective on reality. Amen. And what you think is reality has been distorted because of your thought process. And so now you get to the place where you think that life is not worth living. I mean, that's a life in the pit of hell. Come on, give God a praise. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah finds himself in a moment of frustration. He finds himself in a moment of, of discouragement because what he thought was going to happen didn't happen. How I many know that discouragement comes from your thought? It comes from your thought process. He lost his perspective. He lost his outlook. He lost his view. And his, 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 his viewpoint was all messed up. Now, how I many know that if the enemy can get your viewpoint all messed up, if he can get your outlook all messed up, then he can start playing with your thought process. Here's a, a, a prophet of God that just had a great victory. If you read the story, you know he had a great victory with killing the false prophets of Baal. You see, you call down your, you know, you call down, you call on your God and I call on my God and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And God answered by fire and consumed up the enemy on behalf of the men of God. But just after this great victory of God, he has this moment of frustration, this moment of discouragement to hit him. I mean, the enemy normally comes just after you had a breakthrough. Amen. Just after you got some good news, here come the enemy. Just when you have a day that you say, I'm going to shout and scream, an hour later, here comes something that's trying to hit you between the eyes. That's the operation of the enemy. Amen, somebody. And so Elijah finds himself in this situation, in this moment of frustration, in this moment of discouragement. And now God, he, he starts to deal with him so he can get him turned around away from this discouragement in verse 8. In verse 8, the text says, and he rose and he did eat and drink and went in strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto her up the mount of God. Verse 9, the text says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou hear, Elijah? Now God asked the question, because now he's discouraged. He goes to a cave. He's just going to go in and soak in his frustration, soak in his discouragement. How many know that that's what the enemy wants? He wants you to soak. He wants you to sit in self-pity. He wants you to get isolated by yourself in a dark corner, in the booth, somewhere, all by yourself. Here, the man of God is in a cave, dark cave by himself, after this great victory. And that's what the enemy wants to do to some of you. He wants to get you in a, a dark place where you're sitting there soaking and feeling sorry for yourself. And so, what's going on? You're going inward. God doesn't want you going inward. And the man of God, he's going inward. So God asks him a question. God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, how many know that when God asks you a question, it's not like he wants you to inform him of what's going on. How many know that when God asks you a question, he's really asking the question so you can re see what you are going through and what you're dealing with. He wants you to talk to you. 
When God asks you a question, he's not looking for you to inform him because he knows everything. Come on, somebody. God is inviting the man of God to pour out his heart. In other words, what's going on with you, Elijah? Why are you here? What's, what's, what's going on? And God, he knows what's going on, but God wants him to get out of his heart what's going on. And oftentimes we get discouraged and we get depressed because we go inward and we keep in what we should be getting out. Amen, somebody. But God knows what's going on with you. Turn to your neighbors and neighbor. Jesus knows. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8, Jesus said, your father knows what you have need of before you even asked him. I mean, know that when we pray, it's not like we're praying to ask God to do something that he doesn't already know we need. God knows what we need. That's what's so amazing about him. Amen, somebody. And Elijah, he replies, he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God Almighty in verse 10. He says, I've been very jealous for the Lord. In other words, Elijah was saying, you know what? I've been doing this Christian thing for you. Fighting on your behalf. Dealing with these false prophets of Baal. Trying to protect your integrity. Trying to do what you told me to do. In other words, Elijah was saying, you know what? I shouldn't be dealing with this. I shouldn't be going through this. How many of you feel like that sometimes? That you shouldn't be dealing with what you're dealing with. You should be going through what you're going through. Amen, somebody. There are times when stuff comes up that you feel like, you know what, I just should not be dealing with this stuff. I shouldn't have to deal with this person. I shouldn't have to deal with this issue. I shouldn't have to deal with this. I shouldn't have to deal with this drama. Amen, Amen somebody. He says, I'm the only one who has to deal with this. And sometimes we feel the same way. We feel that we're the only ones that have to go through what we're going through. We feel like we're the only ones dealing with what we're dealing with. How many know that you're not the only one going through what you're going through? Come on, give God a praise. But in verse 11 and verse 12, the text says this. And he said, go forth and stand up on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake verse 12 and after the earthquake a fire but the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire a still small voice now watch what's going on the Lord instructs him to stand in front of the cave and as he stands in front of the cave you have an earthquake you have wind and you have fire and the text lets you know that God was not in any of that. But then there was a still, small voice that came, that spoke to him. This is so powerful in the text. To me, this is one of the most powerful uh, points in the text. It's a typical point in the text to me because it's in there for a purpose to let you know, watch this, that when you are in a position of frustration, when you are in a position of irritation, when you are in a position of discouragement. This text, like no other text, lets you know that it is not the miraculous activity that you need to get out of your frustration. Please don't miss that. He saw the miraculous of the wind, the miraculous of the earthquake, the miraculous of the fire. But God was in none of that. Amen. Oftentimes we think if I can get, get, just get somebody to lay hands on me, I'm going to be all right. If I can just get to church and Pastor Doug just anoint me with oil, I'm going to be okay. I'm telling you, sometimes it's not the miraculous activity that's going to get you out of your funk. Amen, somebody. The text says it was a still small voice. Elijah, he, has, he, he saw God feed him with ravens. He experienced God feed three people with some meal and some oil. He saw God raise someone from the dead. Hello, somebody. 
He saw the miraculous. He saw God. He just saw God rain fire down from heaven to consume his enemies. The Bible says that the fire was so hot that the fire sucked up water. Consumed the sacrifice. He just, he's used to the miraculous. He walked in the miraculous. He understood the miraculous. It was not the miraculous activity that got him out of his funk. It was the still, small voice of the Lord. What are you saying, Pastor Doug? I'm trying to say in a roundabout way, when you find yourself frustrated, when you find yourself discouraged, it's not, I got to be careful how I say this, it, 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 it's not the trimmings of church. It's not the praise team. It's not the choir. It, it's not me anointing you with oil. It's not me laying hands. I can lay hands on you and you can roll around like a fish in the, in the, in the floor. But that's not what's going to deliver you. That's not what's going to break you through. Because what you're dealing with is in your mind. It's not in your physical body. It's in your thought pattern. What you need when you're feeling discouraged, when you're feeling depleted, when you're feeling beat up by life, what you need is a word spoken into your spirit. You need a word with your name on it. You need a revelation that God is speaking directly to you. Have you ever heard a message and you go out and you say, you know what, that, that was my word right there. God, God spoke to me right then. That, that was my word. I had somebody call me last week and it was just on fire. That, 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 that word, that was my word right there. That was my word. Now that may not have been your word, but that person said, you know what, that was my word right there. And that's what you need when you find yourself in a situation where life is trying to get the best of you, when you're trying to go inward and you don't want nobody to know what you're dealing with. You're trying to be spiritual. You're, you're trying to be upbeat. You're trying to let everybody know that, you know, I'm blessed. I'm cool. I, I, I'm blessed of the Lord. And, but inside, inside, something's going on. Some of you this morning, there's something going on in you. Yes, you in church, but you, you know it ain't working. That's why you smile, but behind the smile, there's frustration. That's why you usher, but behind the ushering, there's disappointment. That's why you sing, but behind the song, there's still a sad continence. Why? Because it's not working. Just turn to your neighbor and say, this church stuff ain't working. That's why some folks just stay home. They're like, this, 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 church, this church stuff ain't, this ain't working. To the right minister, this, 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 this ain't work. it ain't working. Sitting up in here with these masks, so this, 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 this it ain't working. You know, I know it ain't working. You know why it's not working? Because that's not what you need. What you need is a word from the Lord that gets down into your spirit that causes you to get a revelation of who the God that you serve is. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. This is why David says in Psalms 119, verse 25, the Living Bible Translation, David, he says, I am completely discouraged. Revive me by your word. Oh, glory. David, I, David said, God, I am completely discouraged. But he said, you know what? God, if you can just give me your word, I shall revive. I shall live. I shall rise. Come on, give him a praise. The Bible said he sent his word and he healed them. There's something about the word of God. There's something about the logos of God that can change your whole disposition. It can change your whole life. 
It could change your whole perspective on life. There's something about the word of God that when it gets into you, when it becomes the engrafted word, it changes. Your situation won't change, but it changes. Something changes. And what changes is the word gets down into your heart. It gets down into your spirit. Something about the word of God. This is why the enemy wants you to close your Bible. Don't go hang out with the saints. Don't get no word. You just go into your cave and you soak. Because then he can work on your mind. He can make you go inward. He can twist your perspective on life. He can get you to look just at the moment that you're dealing with and not what's ahead of you. How many know there's a lot more ahead of you than what's behind you? <laughs> but if you've been dealing with frustration and discouragement these past few weeks, there's a word for you over in Ephesians chapter 3. Go over there. Ephesians chapter 3. There's a word from God for you. I'm curious if you've been dealing with frustration and discouragement, a little irritation. If you're not ashamed to admit it, raise your hand. Yeah, that's over half the church. Hmm. I got a word for you. God has a word for you. Just turn to your neighbors and neighbor. God's got a word for you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's your word. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Just touch your name and say, neighbor, that's your word. Come on, give him a praise. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you might ask or think. Now, they, they teach you when you are dissecting scripture, when you are going through your Bible study, they, they, they teach you that when you study the Bible and when you study a verse, you should look for a principle application, and then a promise. There is a principle, and there's an application, and there's a promise in this verse. The principle is that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. God can do exceedingly abundantly. Now, he could have just said God can do, but he adds some adjectives in here. He says God can do exceedingly abundantly. In other words, no matter what concerns you this morning, no matter what you're dealing with this morning, God has the ability to handle it. No matter what tries to get you down, no matter what tries to get the best of you, Paul wants you to know that the God that you serve has the capacity within himself to address that thing was getting the best of you. Come on, somebody. Yeah. I like to put it like this. God can handle your stuff. Yeah. Amen. I mean, this, sometimes there's some stuff I can't handle, but then I, I, I remember, you know what, God can handle it. I know God can handle your stuff. He's able. 
Jesus puts it like this. Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Yeah. Jesus says, it may be impossible with flesh. It may impo be impossible with that human individual that you're dealing with. But he says, make no mistake about it, it's not impossible with God. Man, I wish I have a church. I feel like preaching. Y'all just looking at me. I'm trying to tell you, God can handle your mess. He can handle your stuff. He can handle your disappointments. He can handle whatever is trying to get the best of you. Jesus himself says, it's not an impossibility with the God that you serve. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Come on, wake yourself up. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to give it to you the way the Holy Spirit gave it to me. I, when I was writing and just kind of doodling around Mother Con, the Holy Spirit gave it to me like this. He said, an impossibility is impossible with God. <laughs> I had to get up and take a break. I had to get up and take a, 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 what I, a, a ginger ale break. <laughs> uh, impossibility is impossible with God. What does that mean, Pastor? That it means there is nothing that you can present to God that he can't handle. Now he says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. Now he could have said he's able to do, but he uses two adjectives. Paul uses two adjectives to describe, tried to get across to the reader, just how capable Jehovah is. When I was a little boy, going through school, um, I was a little challenged. And um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I would sit and listen when they start talking about adjectives, nouns and pronouns and verbs. For whatever reason, that intrigued me. I would sit and listen to all that. But when they start talking about sitting structure and all that, I'd run up down the hall. Don't judge me. But I, I can remember distinctly about adjectives and nouns and pronouns. And Paul, he uses two adjectives to describe to us or try to get a, he try, he's trying to paint a picture. When you use adjectives, you're trying to paint a narrative. You're trying to get the reader to, to visualize what you're saying, if I remember my teaching correctly. And Paul, when he's talking to the church, he uses these adjectives to try to get us to understand just how incredible God is. He uses two words. He says, now on to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. These are the two adjectives he uses. The Greek meaning for exceedingly means over, above, and beyond. The Greek meaning for abundantly means excessive. More than enough. <laughs> so Paul is saying, now on to him that is able to do over and above and beyond excessively above all that you might ask or think. <laughs> Man, I wish you helped me out. Paul said, if you can imagine it, I mean, if your mind has the capacity to even imagine it, Paul says, God can go beyond that. <laughs> Paul says, if you can dream it, 
The God that you serve can take it to the extreme. Paul said, if you have enough nerve to ask God for it, God's able to do it in an excessive, over-the-top way. <laughs> Woo, he's over the top. He's excessive. He's just, he's just too much. <laughs> Paul says, I want you to understand who you serve. Now on to him who, who is able. He could have stopped that. Who is able to do, but he didn't stop there. Paul said, I'm going to paint you a picture. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, over and above, beyond, excessively. Over anything you can imagine, over anything you can think, on anything you can ask him for. He says, your God is just over the top. want to tell you something so bad. This, this past week, Minister Tower has been mind-blowing. God spoke something to me like two weeks ago. I can't tell you though. He said, you can't tell him yet, son. I said, I can't get ahead of, ahead of God. <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm just going, God, I'm going to tiptoe around it. Le let me do that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell a lot. I just want to tiptoe around it. <laughs> About the boost. This week was incredible. And I want to tell it. And God knows Pastor Ian wanted to tell it because she can't hold water. I know, I know she wants to tell it. And I told her, I said, don't you do it. You're going to get me, get me in trouble with God. God said, don't tell him. <laughs> don't you tell him. <laughs> don't you tell him. Not yet. I'm just going to tiptoe around it, though, Jesus. <laughs> God spoke to something, something to me about two weeks ago. And he told me he was going to do something. And uh, I knew it was him. I knew it was him. I, I know the voice of God. But in my mind, I'm thinking it was going to come this way. How I many know that we always think God's coming that way? And then God comes up from the floor. And I, I, uh, uh, he did it. And when he did it, <laughs> it was excessive. It was over the top. Watch this. I couldn't even imagine it. That's how awesome God is. He's an amazing God. And there's times I'm telling you I try to get discouraged. There's times I'm telling you I have moments of frustration. I'm telling you there's times when I have moments of doubt. But I'm telling you it's just a moment. Because when I start thinking about the goodness of my God, when I start thinking about what he's able to do, when I start thinking about what he's already done, I can't stay there. I can't soak in it. I can't pout in it. I got to open my mouth. I got to give him praise. Because I know what he's able to do. I know what he's already done. So I, I'm just going to tell you, you know, I try, I try to have a pity party. I, I try to be discouraged. I, I try to be frustrated. But it don't last long because when I start thinking about the goodness of God. Woo! I can't stay there. <laughs> I just can't stay there. I can't. I can't. I, 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 you know, I, I can't stay there. Because I know he's a healer. I've seen him heal people from cancer. I've seen him heal people from age. At my own hand, I can't stay there. 
I know he's a provider because I've seen him provide. Watch this. Not just $300, but I've seen him provide down to the very cent. I know he's a provider. I know he's able. Because just when I thought I was going down, He comes in like eagle wings and sweeps you up. Now I'm telling you this morning, if once you get a revelation that your God is able, those moments of discouragement, that's all right, but just shake them off. You'll be able to shake them off. Now be seated, let me finish this. He said, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that he asks to think according to the power that worketh in us. Now here's the application of this verse. This verse says that God will do something. First is the principle that we know that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask to think. That's the principle. God can do exceedingly abundantly. But now the application is it's conditional. He says according to the power that worketh in us. So the condition is God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask to think, but it's conditional. It's based on the power that worketh in us. You have to have the right power working in you, but if you have the right power working in you, the principle is going to work. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. <laughs> Elijah didn't go for all the miraculous stuff. What got him out of that dark cave, what got him out of that wrong thinking was the still, small voice that spoke directly into his spirit. And I'm telling you this morning, for those of you who have been experiencing frustration and irritation, and discouragement, you got to listen to that still small voice that's going to get you out of that place of darkness. It's not going to be the praise team. It's not going to be the choir. It's not going to be Pastor Doug laying hands on you. It's not going to be oil placed on your forehead. It's going to be the word of the Lord spoken directly into your heart. Let me say that again. Your life is affected and a reflection of the voices that you're listening to. And if you are experiencing a moment of frustration, I'm telling you, it's because you are listening to a voice that's telling you it won't get better. You can't do it. It's telling you something negative about something that has not yet happened. Watch this, that has not yet happened. When you have in your hand the ability to change the future. Now, how do we build up the power that worketh in us? Now watch this, if you are a born again believer, you have the presence of the living God dwelling in you. Your Bible says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the power, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen, somebody. But Jude explains to us how we get that power up. How many know that your vehicle has a battery? And once you run that vehicle for so long, that, that battery, the, the, the power gets drained, it goes down. And eventually, if you're not careful, the battery will go dead. And sometimes when the battery goes dead, you can jump that battery off somebody else's battery. And that's what some of you have been doing. Your, your spiritual life has gotten so low, but now you're getting jumps off the other saints. Other saints are trying to jump start you because your spiritual battery is low. Your, the power base within you, you allow to get low. But then some of you, you are completely depleted. And that's when that frustration and irritation comes in. But Jude now, he tells us, go to Jude chap chapter 1. There's only one chapter in there. 
the book right there was one little small little book right before Revelation Jude he tells us how to get that power base up he says in verse 20 but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost come on somebody Jude said you build yourself up by praying in the Holy Ghost some of you you have allowed your spirit man to get so low that frustration is easy to take root in your heart you're easily discouraged because your spirit man has been allowed to get low I know you got to keep yourself built up if necessary you got to talk to yourself David encouraged himself in the Lord if necessary you got to tell yourself okay I mean if you just got to have a moment to say okay I'm, I'm, I'm two hours I'm gonna be discouraged for two hours but after that I got stuff to do now watch this you're not going by how you feel you go in my faith I know it works because that's what I do when I get discouraged I tell myself you know what I have until 12 o'clock to sit here and get discouraged but after that I got work to do and then by faith I move out and do my work I still do it discouraged but after a while that discouragement turns into a joy I get victory over it see discouragement is just a feeling and you're feeling the way you feel because you're thinking a certain way you change the way you think you change how you feel that's why you got to tell yourself, you know what, I, I'm 30 minutes doing this and I got to move on. Hallelujah, somebody. You got to keep yourself built up. Let me read you Jude out of chapter 1, verse 20, in the message translation. I'm almost done. Jude chapter 1, verse 20, the message translation. The text says, but you, dear friends, carefully build yourselves up in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit staying right at the center of God's love keeping your arms open and outstretched ready for the mercy of our master Jesus Christ this is the unending life the real life now allow me to read it to you out of Amplified but you beloved build yourselves up founded on your most holy faith watch this make progress Rise like an edifice higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. He says, like an edifice higher and higher. In other words, raise yourself up. When you feel yourself going low, raise yourself up higher and higher. How? By praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on, give God a praise, somebody. He said, Pastor Doug, I don't have my prayer language. Oh, we can solve that today. But you need to be praying in the Holy Ghost. You need to be praying, building yourself up. I'm telling you right now, if you feel a moment of frustration, you feel a moment of discouragement, that's when you need to go in and start praying right there. You need to just go ahead and just start praying. Whether you feel like it or not, you need to just go ahead, stretch your arms towards God and just start telling God what's going on with you. That's why God asked Elijah, what's going on with you? What, what, what's going on, Elijah? God was saying, I want you, I want to invite you to pull your heart out. Get that stuff out of your heart. That's what you need to do. Some of you need to get that stuff out of your spirit, out of your heart. That's how you get stuff out of you. You pray it out. Come on, somebody. Lift yourself up, praying in the Holy Ghost. Let me close on this. The right response to discouragement and frustration is relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When you rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you through, a discouraged Christian is an ineffective Christian. That's why the enemy wants to fight you all the way because he does not want you being effective for the kingdom you just have to get a hold 
for the fact that the God that you serve is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above whatever you can imagine, whatever you could think, and whatever you have the nerve to ask him for. He can top that. Come on, give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. He's very able. And the scriptures say he's an ever-present help in the time of trouble. Amen. Yes, he is. Our offering scripture will be coming from the book of uh, Malachi and also from the book of Genesis. In Malachi it reads at the beginning at three and the, the third chapter beginning at the tenth verse it said bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now he will say the Lord of hosts if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there is not room enough to receive. I want to focus in on one word in there, which is the word uh, prove, which simply says investigate. When you look it up in the Hebrew, it means investigate, try me, test me, investigate me. And see, won't I do what I said I would do? You know, the scripture tells us to cons. Uh, compare spiritual with spiritual. So we want to look at another word, uh, passage of scripture. How many of you notice that it seems like when you go in the store now, everything is hot. Man, I'm like, when you go in the store now, I'll buy some or get something done now, it seems like they want to charge you an arm and a leg now. I don't know if that's just me or is things really going up? Boy, I'm like, I'm like, is it going up because things ain't got tough like that or they going up just because they can go up? You know, that's a book I've been reading called, uh, uh, it's called, uh, just, just that quick. It, uh, it's called, uh, I, I think of it here in a minute. Well, my scripture in the old, uh, one of the other scriptures in the book of Genesis, which is Genesis 26, we're going to look at in relationship to what Malachi said, prove God. He said, which the word mean investigate. Let's see whether or not God is doing what he say he's going to do. Genesis 26 shows that God does what he say he's going to do. In Genesis 26, in the first verse it says, and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine. That was in the days of Abraham. In the days of Abraham, and Isaac. And Isaac went unto Amalek, king of the Philistines. And we want to turn over to the 12th, the next verse, which is the 12th verse. It said, Then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. You know, the scripture said, Prove me, and see what I open unto you the windows of heaven. Investigate me. You know, normally in during the times of famine, they, they didn't sow because that was a drought in most cases. This was an agrarian society. So during the times of famine, they didn't even attempt to sow because there was no rain. I was listening to one of the uh, ministers giving his testimony on a, on a broadcast I was listening to. He said he visited this little country in Africa, this little place in Africa. He said he was in a, a bad famine. They was in a drought. And he said he noticed this little missionary place was feeding all of the children in the area. And people were going there to get fed. And, and he was wondering how he was they able to do it. He said when he went to visit the pastor of this little missionary, he said he asked him, how are you able to feed these kids and, and feed all these people because there's a drought. He said, come here and let me show you. He took him to the back of the area of the little missionary 
and they had a big field back there and they were growing crop every which way. He said, well, how are you able to grow crop and there's a famine? He said, we've been getting rain. To show you the power of God, he said, we've been getting rain. Even though there was a drought, they were getting rain because he believed and trusted in the God that we believe and trust in. And the God that Isaac was trusting in said, I'm gonna bring you rain. You go on and sow your crop. And the scripture said, I had to receive a hundredfold return on his sowing because he dared to believe and step out on God. When you give into the kingdom of God, I don't care what, oh yeah, the, the, the book that I read is called Spiritually by Design. I think a lot of what's going on is by design. But regards to how they design it, God is able to bless you in this time that we're living in. Regards of how they try to conspire to make everything go up on us, God is still able to meet your needs according to his riches in glory. If you dare to give, dare to pay your tithe, and dare to sow it into the kingdom of God. God said, if you investigate me and Isaac, the scripture shows that Isaac received the hundredfold return, even though there was a famine in the land. He dared to sow, and God blessed him. Amen. So if you dare to sow, God will meet your needs. And the scripture said, in that same year, he received the hundredfold return. God will bless you the same as he blessed Isaac. Amen. The ushers are going to come and around and receive you all. everyone that have had the opportunity to give or given praise God well I want to ask you to point your hands at the offering bucket gracious and awesome God we thank you because the word tells us you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness every blessing from above father have been already given to us and our sowing we ask that you bless this the sowing that we've sowed today, Father. Let that be a hundredfold return on the people of God who sow this day. Before this year out, let us see a tremendous return on their giving. In the name of Jesus, we break every assignment of the wicked one to hold back what you've already released into our corpus. In Jesus' name, we decree it and we thank you for it. And let everyone say amen. God bless you. You know, I don't want to take for granted that everyone here is, is saved and, and knows the Lord. I recognize that it may be one or two that, or three that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe someone watching by YouTube who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to lead you into the prayer of salvation, the salvation prayer. And I want everyone just to repeat that to me as I lead you into this prayer. Amen. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died. And on the third day was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand, praying for me that I might have life 
and have it more abundantly. Father, I ask that Jesus Christ come into my life, come into my heart, and be my personal Lord and Savior. Now, Father, by faith, I believe in my heart that I am saved, that I am born again, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time, please let us know. We want to celebrate with you. The ushers are here. Just walk up to one of the ushers and let them know that you've given your life to the Lord. If you're watching my YouTube and you've given your life to the Lord, there's some information on the screen. Contact us. Let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Amen. And then lastly, before I leave, or before we leave, or we close out, um, you may be here in Zen, but Pastor, I want to be a part of this local body of believers, and I would like to uh, join, and if that's you, I want you to just wave at me. We want to acknowledge you. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I want to be part of this body, part of this vision, and I want to join, just wave at me. We will uh, accept you. Amen. 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 Well, if our hearts and minds are clear, Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for the people of God. Father, we thank you for their hunger for righteousness, their pursuit of the truth. Right now, Father, I release your people. I release them under your divine protection and in your love. I pray that you keep them safe, Father. Let no harm or no pestilence come nigh their dwelling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your week.